Distinguished Speaker Series. Today we present illustrator, author, graphic designer, and Google Creative Director Jennifer Daniel. Uh, and I want to thank our partners for their support, AIGA Detroit and the Detroit Creative Corridor Center, stewards of the UNESCO City of Design designation, and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. I don't know if you all heard the breaking news. I just got a news alert that the United States has just signed something saying that we will no longer be part of UNESCO. Just moments ago. So I don't know what that means for Detroit's design city designation through UNESCO, but we do appreciate their partnership. Uh, anyway, uh, we have stacks on the stage today. We're camping out. We're, there's a comedian. Some of you may know Tom Segura, who's following us. I never like camping out on the stage with stacks, but we're doing it today. And I'm telling you, you're getting the better show. Because I think Jennifer Daniel could actually have a second career as a stand-up comic. Uh, anyway, I have just a couple of announcements for you before we get going today. Uh, it's your last chance to see Vital Signs for a New America the unfinished and the Unfinished Conversation, which closes this Saturday, October 14th. That's at the Stamps Gallery around the corner on Division. So you should check those out if you have not already. Next week, we have a Penny Stamps special event. So outside of our regular Thursday programming here at the Michigan Theater, Next week, we'll have a special event at the Museum of Art, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, down the street on State Street, where we will host Mark Dion, uh, Waiting for the Extraordinary. Some of you may remember Mark spoke here in the, in the main series here on the Michigan Theater stage a few years back. Uh, this is a bicentennial event, which has to do, he spoke here actually in for the university called Waiting for the Extraordinary, which was co commissioned by the Institute for the Humanities. And he's coming back, and he is reworking this work. This is a work that focuses on the original blueprint for the university. Uh, and it's 13 distinct classifications of knowledge incorporating 3D replicas of artifacts and U of M uh, museums and collections. So he's restaging this work. You can actually currently and go see it, the, the new restaged version at the Institute for Humanities, and then join us next week, Wednesday, 5.30, at the museum uh, for Mark is gonna give us a special presentation. And then of course, we'll see you back here with our regular season next Thursday, same time, same place, for Kiki Smith. Uh, uh, today, we will have our regular Q&A in the screening room, not in here. So if you want to uh, come and meet Jennifer and ask her some questions, join us directly following her presentation. Out the doors to the left, down the hallway, you'll find the screening room, another theater here in the building. And now, to give a proper introduction for Jennifer today, please welcome sound artist and stamp school professor, Stephanie Rowden. Good evening. It is a real pleasure to welcome Jennifer Daniel to the Stamp Speaker Series. Jennifer is, as Christina mentioned, an illustrator, graphic designer, author, and a regular contributor to the New York Times and the New Yorker. And she's currently creative director at Google after having been graphics editor at the New York Times. And if that weren't impressive enough, she is also the proud mother of twin toddlers. Yep. <laughs> I think of Jennifer Daniel as a visual storyteller who's extraordinarily fearless about form, a sharp writer who knows how to ask really good questions of herself and of us. So a few brags about her work. Fast Company calls her a genius at information design. In her latest book, the best looking science book ever created. Her work has been recognized by the Art Directors Club, the Society of Publication Designers, the Society of Illustrators, AIGA, and many others. The title she gave us for this evening is Talk to Me. And that made me think about conversation and the sparks that possible the most memorable of conversations. Moments that are surprising, funny, unexpected, spontaneous, vulnerable, and make you do a double take. 
coincidentally, all qualities I find in Jennifer's work. So needless to say, this is a conversation I am really looking forward to. So please join me in a warm welcome for Jennifer Daniel. Hello. Hi. That was just so generous and lovely. I am um, so flattered to be here. So thank you all. I just want to take a little peek. Wow, look at all those faces. I don't know why you're here. Why are you here? Uh, it's funny, I was um, talking to a friend last weekend that I was going to be in Ann Arbor, and he's from Grand Rapids, and he was like, oh, uh, you're in Ann Arbor. When are, you, when are you in town? And I said, oh, just a few days, Wednesday through Friday. And he goes, oh, you know, you should see who's speaking at the Penny Talks lecture series. <laughs> and I said, I will do that. Uh, so here I am, and I'm really, really excited to talk to you uh, and hope to hear from you as well uh, and a little bit about how I express myself. And so this is a picture of me smiling. I'm happy. This is me being a little flirty. This is me trying to prepare my lecture slides for this. This is Michael Jordan. And this is actually the entire plot to the movie Dune, <laughs> which I can't take credit for, but is very accurate. And this is the entire plot to the year of 2017. <laughs> so our, our vocabulary is getting larger and more expressive. <laughs> And more universal. It's so amazing that all of you completely understood what I meant. Without, it was just a garbage fire, you know? Anyways. Um, so it wasn't long that if I had to express that I'm sad, I had to type, I'm sad, right? And then emoticons came along, and everyone was like, whoa, you're really sad. And then shortly after that, emojis debuted, uh, and they became a whole language onto their own. And it didn't take long for opportunists to say, yo, I want to commodify that. And they started selling stickers like Kimoji and Just Moji and, I don't know, Moji Talk by DJ Khaled. Uh, and they're not really emoji, they're more like digital stickers. Uh, but regardless, this is a, like a range of expression that you can use to communicate yourself uh, online. And I just want to do a little shout out to Michael Phelps, <laughs> who has a very expressive emoji kit here. You know, when you're feeling like black swimsuit, <laughs> or blue swimsuit, <laughs> or like, I don't know, 10 gold medals feeling, or kissing metal, or just posing with metal. I don't know, like, for whatever, this, yeah, I hope he uses it, because I don't think anyone else is using it. <laughs> Besides myself, maybe. Um, so today, for about an hour, we're gonna look at all these ranges, this range of ways to express yourself, uh, and this sort of divergence of communication and messaging. And, and one way to look at it is through our visual vocabulary and the inventory that we have uh, at our disposal. And it kind of takes, it makes up a very emergent complexity. Contrary to what we commonly think, texting, I think, is closer to speaking than it is to writing, which I will explain. If we think about language, it has existed for like 150,000 years, right? Uh, at least 80,000 years. And first, it arose as speech. People talked. That's how we use language most. Writing came along much later, and there's controversy about like when that happened. According to John McCoulter, who's a Columbia professor, a uh, linguistic professor at Columbia University, um, if humanity existed for 24 hours, writing only came at 11.07 p.m., right? So it came along much, much later. So first there was speech, and then writing comes along. <laughs> and this is how we talk. And while writing and talking are very different ways of communicating, because when you write, it is a, a conscious process. You look forwards and backwards, and you do things with language that are must, much less likely if you're talking. 
Linguistics have shown that when you're speaking in an unmonitored way, we usually speak in word packets of like seven to 10 words at a time. And that's what speech is like. It's looser, it's telegraphic, it's less reflective. And texting is loose. It's much more similar to speaking than it is to writing, despite the mechanics. Uh, no one thinks about capitalization and punctuation when they're talking uh, or when they're texting. And we don't do that when we're speaking, right? So um, texting may have similar process to writing, but as McCorder continues in his essay, really texting is like fingered speech. We text the way we talk. And now we talk with words, yes, but also with gifs, <laughs> memes, emojis, sometimes a mash of all of them all at once. And while the sources of many of these are largely defined by a group of people or a person, I don't know, if, have all of you seen this actual video of this little kid? Because it is exceptional meme material. <laughs> he is so cute. And his brothers are so, they're perfect actors for it. Um, but the point is that everyone saw something that happened in the world and they had a response to it. They, like, they felt an urge to be able to communicate with, to, to it and with it. And that is amazing. And, and you see that online everywhere. You see it with memes, you see it with GIFs. Um, but there's one place that you don't see it largely and that's emojis. So emojis are, I think we all are familiar with them, but just some like brief little history. Uh, the word is Japanese, and it means basically picture, character, right? So emojis were a very popular and important means of digital communication in Japan. And um, the humanity they offered via text allowed for nuance. And many people cited emoji as a way to apologize when words couldn't express enough and the me uh, messages without emoji felt very dry. So these were the original emoji. Emoji were on three like semi-compatible mobile vendors in Japan, and they were rendered in three very different ways. They also had nothing to do with Unicode uh, until Western vendors came along. And um, for example, Google, right? Google was like, okay, we want to sell phones in Japan. We understand that emoji are really important. We don't want the responsibility of dealing with emoji. So Unicode, Unicode, um, will you, take the, this responsibility, and then Unicode was like, yes, please, no one's paid any attention to us ever. Uh, I will take the responsibility of mapping these bitmapped images and umlauts, and, um, and we want that. Please give me that power. And Google said, cool, that's, your, that's all yours. So what is Unicode? Okay. Basically, Unicode is as close as we get to some sort of universal encoding online. Unicode says that these are characters on a list, and this is what they mean, and th what their names are, and they map between legacy encodings and a universal character set. It's very fascinating. Okay. Uh, so now, true to Emoji's name, Emoji is defined by two attributes, the picture the user sees and the code that is defined by it. So despite Unicode's valiant efforts to try and unify emoji, they continue to be rendered by companies as a means to establish their, consist their, like branded, their branded values. Um, and other emojis be damned, because this is how they are rendered. And emojis are like no joke. They're not like some silly little thing that people like, that teenagers use anymore. They're massively popular. 92% of the online population use emojis, and six billion emojis are sent every day. So this is a good example of how smiling emoji is rendered across many different devices. So if you are on an iPhone, you send that, but if your buddy is on an LG, they get that guy. <laughs> so what's truly remarkable to me is this particular one, which is uh, called Astonished Face. And while this is supposed to be one distinct expression, right, Unicode's resp only responsibility is to provide consistency, uh, I actually see six distinct expressions here, not one. Um, Samsung has had entirely too much caffeine. <laughs> LG is just dead on arrival. And the amount of dilation happening in Facebook, and let's see, emoji one, oops, sorry. Um, 
it's closer to, I don't know, like they're like super, they're on ecstasy, <laughs> right? They're not so surprised, they're like, so, they're like, whoa. <laughs> so one emoji, but eight breeds of dogs, right? You're trying to send this cute little, little dude, and he's cute, but like this guy's way cuter, right? This means something really different, like I kind of want something when I send that. I don't know what, I, that, that, I mean, I guess I'm begging, but like way more subtle, like completely different messages. One emoji, eight different squids. And this is really annoying because when I send my husband this text message, work what's crazy today, octopus, uh, this is what he sees, he has an iPhone, right? And it's like, what, you ate squid? When really, I'm on an Android, and I met this, this little guy. He's like crazy, he's like, work was crazy today. <laughs> ah, make sure there's wine on the table. You know, this guy, what was that? That's nothing, that doesn't say anything. This is the guy I want, I love that guy. The moon is one of my favorite emojis, underappreciated. Sure, there's a crescent moon in there, that's the whole point of it, right? But it's so much more than that. It can be a septum piercing, right? It can be some cheese. Thanks, Facebook. A rotten banana. A toenail. I wish I knew, I, would, I love this one. Um, so the real problem, given that emoji are a means of communication, uh, that they're largely inconsistent across devices. So the problem is that when I, I send this message that's fairly sarcastic, thanks. Uh, oh, actually, I, I want it to be sarcastic, but it looks kind of friendly, right? Like, it's like, thanks. You know, like, eyebrows raised, smile face. But on an iPhone, it renders like this. Right? And this is outrageous. Like, the meanings are totally different. And the emoji, tr emoji translation alone has ruined, like, w at least one of my relationships. <laughs> like, Samsung has got to get it together. That's Apple on Samsung. So the audacity of these corporations deciding the meaning of framed picture, when really, like, the whole meaning of framed picture is that I interpret the meaning of the picture, not Google, not Apple, not Facebook. So, for example, like, when would you use this emoji? Right? I would use this picture frame emoji to describe some sort of idealization. I.e., wow, must be nice to be so sure of your worldview. Beautiful scene. Uh, whereas someone on a different phone would get the message of, wow, <laughs> some dumbass cat. Or the Mona Lisa? <laughs> so specific. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Who wants to be misunderstood? So this pursuit of creating some sort of universal iconography for everyone is, is totally aspirational, but that isn't what's actually happening. Instead, in this pursuit of branding and marketing, the style and details of emojis are offering brands an opportunity to say, oh, look at me. To be fair, aesthetics, are <laughs> largely opinionated, and it's hard to divorce the style from the message, especially if the brand has a very distinct point of view or message they want to convey about who Facebook is and who Apple is. The peach emoji is a great example of how style renders meaning and how in spite of a brand wanting to control their image, the people will ultimately decide what is a peach? <laughs> and what is a butt? <laughs> it's such a good butt. <laughs> but this goes beyond style. Like, every year the Unicode Consortium collects feedback and they say, okay, you can pitch us any emoji you want. And instead of people deciding and thinking of emoji as imagery that builds on text and enhances it in some way, some, some, somewhat like grammar, right? Or punctuation, I mean. Um, Symbols could provide nuance, but instead, petitions are adding things like, um, like a juggler, 
uh, or Mrs. Santa Claus. And so every time I hear someone say, man, I wish I had, there was an emoji for X, I hear, I wish there was an emoji for like a sad flower, a whiskey tumbler, a water polo enthusiast, pregnant lady, second place medal, hang 10, and shruggy, right? So like these are totally valid. These all ex should, ex can exist in the world, but do these tiny pieces of Unicode, are they adding any real value to what already exists in our lexicon? And they can, they have potential to. One of the newest emojis that just came out, I think this week, is the dumpling emoji. And it's particularly interesting because it was a emoji that was kickstarted. And it was proposed not by a company, but by a few individuals who are just trying to fight for representation of themselves in Unicode. Or in the designer's words, uh, it was her, quote, little contribution to cross-cultural communication in the age of globalization. And I love that. I love that notion. It's an exciting idea. But not to be a total downer, at the end of the day, it's the vendors who decide how it's rendered. And instead of getting a dumpling, we got this shit show. <laughs> Cross devices, the emoji can't decide if it's a gyoza, a pierogi, an empanada. It's having an existential identity crisis. Despite the intent for it to be about representation of a community that wanted to be represented in this lexicon, it just became a total mess cross-platform. Now, even the editorial board behind a dictionary doesn't just make up words. They try to keep up with words that are already real to the people using them. And while we normally don't think of language as a place for creativity like art and music, individuals and communities of the world are injecting meaning into these seemingly meaninglessness, uh, just as an artist or a musician would. And it's only through our infinite creativity and our culture that we are able to come up with our identity and our slang. And this is why, outside of creating a modern-day version of the Tower of Babel, while I care so, large, so much about why large corporations in the world are defining language at a scale that's fairly unparalleled. So the, while we go through life mostly unaware of it, humans mimic each other's expressions and emotions when we're talking in person. The emotional contagion of, of our faces are a big part of how we build on empathy and we, we build relationships. And according to a recent study that was published in the Journal of Social Neuroscience, looking at faces crafted from little colons and parentheses can trigger the same facial recognition response in parts of the brain that take place when we gaze into the eyes of a human in meat space. And that is amazing. And that's why it's so important to understand that if emojis and emoticons are the way we digitally express emotion and empathy, and these emojis are defined and curated by brands, then is it no wonder that social media has become an extension of capitalism? So Google recently redesigned their emojis, and I miss those gumdrops, I really do. They were really super duper cute. Um, so if you're measuring a redesign on the success of being are these emojis more universally understood across platforms? Then they're a success. What they basically did was they looked at Apple and they were like, well, everyone has an iPhone. Let's just do what they did. And so they did it, and that's what we have now. And, and in many ways, it, 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 while it seems like too much like a, we'll just follow along, it's the right notion. It's understanding that there's an actual real problem. Most people are communicating on the iPhone right now. Let's at least have some parity. Um, but not to totally contradict everything I've just been talking about for 20 minutes, I still really miss the old ones. Um, like, look at that little dude. <laughs> He's so cute. Who, who is she? <laughs> I want to know who she is. There's, she's such innocent and delight. Instead, now we have these ladies, It's fine. Uh, it's really important that emojis do work cross-platform, since that's how they're embedded in our lexicon. But man, I wish emoji were more like fonts. Fonts like emojis are, are sort of brands in their own way. Like when you use a typeface, you're using the story associated with it. So if you're using Helvetica, you're not just using Helvetica, you're using Helvetica in the 65 years that other people have used Helvetica. These days, the state of emoji support is, reminds me a lot about the early days of web. 
uh, and how they used to su support fonts. There was not much font support back in when I was learning the web. And around 2012 or so, there were about a half dozen formats supported variously by different browsers, but now support is mostly coalesced. And my hope for emoji is there'll be some sort of support where you could flip through different styles of emoji. So when I send that beautiful little gumdrop dancer, no matter what phone you're on, you also see that beautiful little gumdrop dancer. We're not there yet, but I'm closing my eyes and imagining a future where we could get there. And I recently just discovered this concept of emoji ligatures. Are you familiar with this, this notion? So basically, this is how Unicode is able to build on its current inventory without increasing the file size of the emoji library. So you combine two characters to create, or more, to create a third character. So the first one at the top, they combined their white flag with the rainbow, and they got a rainbow flag, right? And it's, I don't really have to explain all of these. These are not like high level thinking here. Uh, but this is basically how we get more emoji. And this is also how Twitter and other brands are able to kind of create some corporate identity. So on Twitter, you can tweet this emoji character. It won't render on anything else besides twitter.com, but you can create a pirate flag. And the same for Microsoft. You can have a little, little pirate or a ninja cat, which is cute. But again, only renders on Microsoft platforms. And vendors really can do anything they want. But sadly, as a regular person who uses emojis to communicate and express myself, I can't on the fly create new ones, which is, which is how slang works. That's how communication works. And I want to create visual slang so desperately. I'm so desperate for it. And what I would give for like a very sarcastic hug, I, I would <laughs> When a friend is going through one of those moments, you know, just like, you'll be okay. <laughs> but I can't. Like, I'm not, I don't have the ability to do so. But it doesn't stop me from wanting to make them. Like, I would love to use this for fake news. <laughs> or like, total poop tornado. It's coming your way. White male tears. Uh, I got my Monday face on. No chill. <laughs> Zero. Oh, got my period. <sighs> I fucking love pretzels. <laughs> I do. I love them so much. This is this is this is what I see when I look in the mirror. Uh, the world's smallest violin. You're my only friend. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> I'll smile when I want to. I'm trying to be better. <laughs> oh, that migraine vibe. <laughs> and this is fine. <laughs> right? So these are all emoji that exist in the world that I've just layered on top of each other and created a ligature, but sadly, I have to do it like in some hacky collage app that's, you know, who knows what it's taking from my phone, right? So like, and like only kind of only use it once unless I am really much smarter about how I organize my images on my phone. Um, I love this quote, and uh, the beautiful thing about how but language is how it evolves, and words don't stand still, right? Like formal writing. Uh, that's a beautiful thing about language and slang is that the, it's like water and it's fluid. And the whole point of of of, of communicating is to is to be able to express yourself, and not being able to express yourself, it it makes you lonely. It makes me lonely, and not having those tools to be able to express myself. Um, and maybe, 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 maybe the fact that the most corporations are deciding what those tools are is extremely frustrating. Um, and I think a really good example of how language evolves is, is the word lol, right? So I could be typing checking my mail. Lol, checking my mail, lol. Like, how many times have you typed this? I mean, I've typed this a lot, and I realize like, lol doesn't mean lol anymore. And who, who says lol? Like, no one's actually laughing out loud. But we use it as a marker of empathy to indicate that like I'm not threatening, that I'm chill, that I'm just ch like checking my email, lol. Like, 
whatever. Tell me something interesting. And, but it does, the word evolved. It used to actually mean something very important, that someone said something really funny. But we've moved on where we just assumed we're all funny. <laughs> and uh, now it just means that I'm a human being. And now, like, LMAO is supposed to mean lol, right? You're like, I'm not lolling. I'm, like, actually LMAOing. And, you know, like, who knows what the next one will be? But it, it's, that's the beautiful thing about it, is that it evolves and, and we learn from it. And a language emerges from human minds from interacting from each other. And it's visible in the unstoppable change we see through slang and jargon and the formation of new languages like texting. So regardless of what the Unicode Consortium approves and disapproves, uh, how big tech renders it, it's, it's the people who really define the language. Uh, there's no dick, no problem. Got that, it's all good. But if I've learned anything from history, it's that if you give humanity a bunch of symbols, we ascribe meaning to them, and we use them to say whatever we want with them. Storytelling is for the people, and the symbol, it just brands it, it just sells it. So speaking of brands, I work for Google. <laughs> um, I have an amazing team that I work with, this is everyone on the team, about 18 of us. Oh, we have a range of backgrounds, they're sort of like the Mighty Ducks. Uh, uh, so we have motion, motion designers, we have researchers, illustrators, art directors, UX designers, uh, project managers, product managers, oh, all their titles are here, so you can already see. Um, we work on a team called Expression, and we, we're pretty scrappy, and we work across all of Google's messaging products, so everything from oh, I don't even, uh, 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 Messenger, <laughs> to uh, Allo, to Duo, Google Photos. Uh, uh, there's, there's a ton. Google has a lot of different uh, uh, fires. What do they call them? Uh, little coals in the fire, I guess. And as a creative director working in the communication space, this is sort of how I see myself. Um, I work at a data-driven company as an artist, and that's really difficult. And I'm, I'm not just, I think people think art director, creative director, oh, they drive the aesthetics of something. But I'm not just dealing with the aesthetics, I'm shaping algorithms as well. So recently I worked on this feature for a messaging app called Allo that uses a combination of neural nets and uh, artwork to turn your picture, your selfie, into a cartoon version of yourself. And it's pretty simple, you just snap a picture and it turns, automatically generates this illustration. And I love selfies. I take a lot of them. Um, and selfies are a really interesting area to explore because they're a daily habit for many. There's the, the car selfie and the, I don't know, the cute outfit selfie, um, the travel selfie. There's all kinds of selfies. I woke up like this selfie. And apart from a social capacity, self-portraiture has long served as a means for self and identity exploration. And, and for some, it's about figuring out who they are. And for others, it's about projecting how they want to be perceived. And for someone like me, sometimes it's both. Part. Sorry, I'm Jennifer Daniel. It's cool. Um, this is Juliet Myers. Uh, um, uh, this, is, this is a really good example. So this is a 17-year-old teenage girl in the 90s and what appears to be a shrine to herself. This is a picture of me. Uh, this is me in high school. Um, and the whole point of identity is, is looking at people in the media and family and, and structures like race and economics and you devise who you want to be in that context. And we hold ourselves up to people, our family, our communities, our friends, and they operate as mirrors. And role playing is a large part of growing up. It's no wonder why video games are so popular. This is NBA Jams. Anyone play this game? Anyone? This is old school, it's fine. Uh, like, who wants to be me when I could be Scottie Pippen? That's dope. I want to be Scottie Pippen. Who wants? I can't do that. Scottie Pippen. And young minds look for identity to try on, look for causes to relate to, and given their values are validated, or they, if they aren't validated, they disregard them, or, or if they were validated, they become rooted. And that means that internet culture grooms an individual and collective groups one way or the other. And this is my favorite tweet from Justin Bieber of all time. 
<laughs> right now, identity online is largely designed to be about satisfy, satisfying other people as a means to satisfy yourself, and this is natural, this pursuit of feeling value and validated, but when identity is derived and validated from the same place, that can be a recipe for disaster. As a teenager, establishing an identity while simultaneously needing to feel accepted is very complicated, and you learn very quickly online who you need to be to get people to like you. <laughs> the way we create our identities is very core to our psychological well-being, and when someone has a strong sense of who they are, they take more risks, they stand up for what they believe in, they go out of their comfort zone. This is how cultures learn and grow and evolve. And visual culture reinforces our identity. The very nature of the selfie taking puts the camera in this area of, of sort of dominance. You see, like, like, I have put myself in a submissive place by putting the camera here. Like, the selfie, its nature has immediately made me less dominant. The camera has all the dominance, actually. And what are we doing to perpetuate this, this model of, of image making and, and how I see myself seeing myself? This is also a very popular selfie, the Belfie. Uh, when you take an image from behind, it's like a classic Renaissance painting. I'm communicating being a seductress, so is my son. You know, it's exactly like this. Same thing. Uh, we, anyways, we reinforce and reproduce what we see in the world from magazine covers and museums and our peers. And selfies are amazing and poignant and they're evident of this primal need to be seen and to be validated and to be recognized and to be understood. But they're just one of many ways to explore identity and culture and individualism and community. But it seems to be the, the only thing that most of the major tech companies are focusing on. So despite living in a selfie culture and photography um, being like the, one of the a very expressive means of communication right now, uh, the team I work on, our hypothesis was that surely there is another way to say I am bored outside of looking at my face. Like you don't need to see my face to understand that I am bored. And so while photography comes with a set, a set of rules that are bounded by reality, illustration on the other hand empowers people to define themselves, to say, um, it's just more warmer and it's less fraught than reality. So to create an illustration, it's very technical, the way um, it can capture your image and take the qualities that would make it recognizable to your friends, um, that requires a pretty robust art team because how a computer sees you is very different than maybe how you see yourself. So this is an example of, of, of nine people with what would be classified as the same haircut. Uh, in the middle is my daughter. Uh, and uh, we created a base truth, right? So here's an icon of, of what we consider to be a short, curly haircut. And then we asked human raters to look at lots of photos and rate if they felt these images looked like this icon. Then once we felt like we had a really good, uh, we had trained the machine, the, 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 the system in a, in a way that felt, we felt confident about, we talked to an artist, Lamar Abrams, who is a storyboard artist, character developer, voice actor for Steven Universe, which is a really popular TV show on Comedy Central. And we asked him to interpret it, uh, interpret this image in his own style. And we were looking at the results, and he, he did a lot of drawings. Um, and he realized that we had kind of only looked at, well, basically he, he, he created a lot of hair. Let me step back. He created a lot of hair. So this is, I think this is about 80 hairstyles. Uh, and if you combine all the different features, because we didn't just do hair, we did uh, head shape, we did nose, we did nostrils, we did eye shape, we did eyebrow shape, we did lip shape. We did skin color, we did hair color, we did, we did a lot of things. And in the end, we get about 563 quadrillion different variations of, of different kinds of people you can make. But what was interesting is that when Lamar started looking at what we were doing, he recognized um, people that weren't represented and what we had trained the machine on. And so thinking about that, we were thinking more about how 
Rather than aiming to replicate a person's appearance exactly, we pursued a really lower resolution model, like, right, the style is not meant to be realistic. It's meant to be super cartoonish, almost emoji-ish, uh, that allowed us to explore expressive representation by returning an image that's less about reproducing reality and more about breaking the rules of representation. So, wait, quickly. So, like, this is, this is obviously me, this is a car selfie. Um, and then this is what the machine learning renders me to look like. But I actually, I don't know why, but I see myself as like a very femi bald man. <laughs> like this is, I, I, I don't, I like, I was like, good, this is like, sure, I get it. But once I started going into the customizer, I was like, nope, I want a big brown turd on my forehead. Uh, and like the computer shouldn't force me to reconcile my identity in a way that doesn't allow me to figure out who I am and not have to know why. Right? It's a good question. I probably should look into it with my therapist, but like, I shouldn't have to do that when I'm texting my friends. So reconciling how the computer perceives you versus how you perceive yourself and what you want to project yourself to be is really a hard artistic exercise. This makes customization feature, including many different hairstyles and skin tones and nose shapes, really essential because by its nature, illustration is, is subjective, right? Uh, so we strove to create a space for a range of race and age and masculinity and femininity and androgyny, and our teams continue to evaluate the res research results to help prevent against incorporating biases while training the system. So how can I, as a creative director, an art director, an illustrator, and designer, how can I design something for everyone when we live in a story we're telling, we live in a world where telling stories is an exercise in cross-cultural communication? particularly when machine learning can reduce data and entire populations of their outliers. Averages don't reveal what makes a society interesting, right? It doesn't tell us what is unique. The average person does not actually exist, and yet large data sets are used to guide the treatment of individual people. So I think it's completely relatable that when people want data to make decisions for them, the data says people like it when we do X. So let's do more of X. People like bananas. Let's give them more bananas. And so you start to see the same thing across all the big tech. I think about this Carl Sagan quote a lot. I love it. I'm sure all of you. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Thank you very much. I love that. I love it so much. And like, I don't see enough people thinking about what they put into the world in this way. They, all, so much of the internet and what you make on the internet is about remixing, right? You take a little of this, you put, make it a little of this, and you get something new. And, and what, what he's saying is that if you want to actually invent something like an apple pie, like you can't just go to the store and get some apples and some flour and some sugar. Like you have to you have to invent the apple tree. You have to invent the seed. You have to invent the oxygen. You have to invent everything. You have to invent the entire universe to actually make something original. And I, I think that's extremely ambitious. Uh, but this is usually what happens in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> instead of people inventing the universe, uh, they end up kind of just merely asking people, what do you want? Do you want that? OK, we'll make that. Uh, and instead of, like, inventing something new, they just fill the apple pie with a different filling. And uh, that makes me sad. So as an art director, I do my best to be aware of machine learning's coded gaze and how this bias in computer algorithms isn't merely a reflection of the world we live in, but it, has, it is proliferating all kinds of problems in society, racism, sexism, elitism, at a massive scale and pace. And as an art director, I, I must check for the computer's blind spots. Now, art directors have an opportunity to unlock inequality as a priority. And instead of conforming to a westernized notion of expression, art directors can work with artists from a large range of perspectives and backgrounds, and through their art, expand our own worldview. Because there's nothing better than looking at a piece of art and seeing the world in that way for the first time. So there's no such thing as a universal aesthetic. This is, this is another example of what you can do in the app a universal aesthetic or like a singular you. The way I talk to my mother is very different than how I talk to my boss 
or how I talk to my husband, or how I talk to my children. And so this whole notion that we have single identities is very arcane and, 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 and wholly inaccurate because uh, there, there is no such thing as a, as a universal you or a singular you. So my team works with a large range of artistic voices, and since we're not beholden to the Unicode Consortium, because these are effectively stickers, uh, we can let the style define the content. It can be sweet, or it can be a little bit more sarcastic and bold, uh, and it's a really exciting place to be. And just this week, we launched a new style in this program, so you can turn yourself into a baby. Uh, these are some people who I work with, uh, which, I would, if you knew them, I'd shout them out, but you don't, so there's no inside joke to really appreciate. But you know who you do know is, is Drake, <laughs> right? Uh, we have a little DJ Khalid, uh, baby Frida Kahlo, toddler Kim Kardashian, and Queen Beyonce. Uh, so when people ask me what I do, I often just say, eh, I'm a creative director. But given that I work in the communication space at a place like Google, really what I do is explore the differences between messages and communication, the feelings around identity, like who am I versus who am I supposed to be? And these are rich areas to explore, and the curious thing about identity and language is that what makes you unique, what, the things that make you unique also bond you with other people. So that's why, in the end, I'm not interested in spending my energy into finding new ways to communicate in this like little box in my pocket. Um, this box, that phone, won't exist 10 years from now. So I much prefer to focus on how we communicate as human beings, exploring identity and the divergence of messages and communication. And I'm interested in different mediums and different languages and why we combine them and the strengths and weaknesses that can be applied to language. And now I don't have really words to express like what I'm feeling, but I have these emojis. And I think the complex part about being an, a creative person in a data-driven company is engineers tend to think that there is always a, a right answer to a problem. But there is no right answer to the questions that I have. Um, but fortunately, uh, because <laughs> words have been replaced with emojis, I don't actually have to articulate necessarily exactly how I feel right now, but I feel like party popper, party popper, hands up monkey kind of feels how I feel right now, being in Ann Arbor. And um, I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you guys at the Q&A and later tonight. It's been a really pleasure talking to all of you, so thank you.